Luke chapter 1. You know, Paul tells us in Galatians that in the fullness of time, in other words, exactly at the right time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the curse of the law. You know, as you look at history and I, uh, uh, and look at his story, uh, there's really three basic events. You can throw a fourth one in there if you want to look at the flood. But, uh, you know, we're all children of Adam, are we not? Uh, that's what the Bible says. I don't care what uh, the, sci- the so-called scientists say. But if they can lie about that, then they could also t- tell us that uh, he didn't make male and female. But we won't get into that discussion right now. But uh, we see that, uh, that there was creation, there was the fall, there was the flood that all affected us, and then there was the cross. And the next thing that we're looking for is the consummation. We're looking for the Lord coming again, are we not? And that's basically history in a nutshell, what God's doing. All the Old Testament was looking forward to the Redeemer coming. And, they, and now we look back that he came, but we're looking forward to him coming again. Uh, so, but what God does, and he's got his exact time, he's got his exact places. He's a thoroughly uh, omniscient planner. He knows the end from the beginning. There's no detail that escapes his notice. I was uh, noticing that there was, people send me all kinds of things, but on the Facebook, somebody sent me a, a little skit where um, there was a wedding. It was in England, I would, so you could tell by their accents. But the pastor was saying, uh, as the bride and groom was standing before him, and the pastor was saying, now, if there's anyone here that has a, whatever that is, you know, the, then speak now or forever, hold your peace. And this lady holds up a piece of paper and says, I do. And everybody was stunned. And she says, the man is married. <clears throat> and he's married to me, and I've got the certificate to prove it. And of course, everybody is just stunned. And the bride is shaky, and she's about ready to fall. And the groom is trying to hold her up. And then the groom finally turns around and looks at the woman. And she says, oh, sorry, wrong church. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, the Lord didn't, when he made his church, he knew exactly what he was doing. And God didn't make any mistakes and he didn't come into the wrong place or whatever else. He knew exactly what he was doing in the fullness of time. And Luke, being the inspired writer, gets it exactly right because if he's inspired, it has to be exactly right because it's the revelation of God. And so we'll begin reading about this Lord coming in chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, notice Dr. Luke. You're going to notice that uh, he really uh, talks about, uh, he talks about um, gynecology. He talks about uh, women's feelings more than anybody else. Uh, he's very good, uh, uh, very good with the personal nature and the family nature of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially with these two ladies that are expecting children through miraculous births. And so we see in the sixth month of whom, John the Baptist was, Elizabeth was expecting him, that the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Excuse me. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and and his kingdom. There shall be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Seeing that I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, 
and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who has called barren. For the Lord, for with God, nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice saying, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And, but why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those, th of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his handmaid. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he is mighty and has done mighty things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and rich he, the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her three months and returned to her own house. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word this morning. Oh, Father, we thank you that you were born to die for us, that there was, you came with a specific purpose, with the omniscient plan. But Lord, you knew exactly what you're doing. And Lord, we are here today because of what you have done, how that you died for us according to the scriptures, how that, more importantly, you rose from the dead according to the scriptures, and how that you offer salvation to all who will believe as they would come to you. Oh, Lord, we pray your blessings upon us this morning as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, how beautifully we see that Luke, who was a great historian, we saw that all through the book of Luke, or excuse me, the book of Acts. But now, of course, he wrote the book of Luke, and both, the, and both of these are historical accounts. And he goes in very detailed into the nativity more than any other, uh, other of the apostles. One reason is because he's a doctor. It's amazing how the Lord raises up certain people to do certain things. Uh, probably John couldn't have written uh, this book, or at least this chapter. Uh, there are things that I can't do in the church that God calls you to do. As we are a body of Christ, each one of us, as Paul says, some of us are hands, some of us are feet, some of us are whatever, but we all work together for the edification of the church as we build one another. Uh, and it's, it's great to see how that God calls people into different vocations and different specialties that I would never dream of having and how that God can use each one of us. And in this, we see that uh, in, 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 Mark, in Matthew, we see that Matthew, in the legal terms of uh, the Lord Jesus coming, he tells us exactly about how that of course, he was from the son, of, the son of David. The Bible opens up with the fact that Jesus was the son of David. And here we see that Luke expands on that. 
as we see, first of all, in verse 16, there's a whole bunch of prophecy in this one or two verses. He says, in the sixth month of uh, the angel Gabriel, he's always the messenger, um, was sent by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. So we see prophecy fulfilled that, um, that uh, in the sixth month, sixth month of whom? John the Baptist. And we know that, and we saw that back just a few weeks ago as we looked in Isaiah chapter 40. And we see that it, the, the one crying in the wilderness makes straight the, way, the path of the Lord. And we see that he was going to be the forerunner. And this was predicted. And now we see it all coming about. And we have Elizabeth, and the, the, the major part, the first part of uh, the chapter doesn't deal with the Lord, it deals with that forerunner. It deals with Zacharias. And again, a uh, miraculous birth, but uh, nothing compared to the uh, immaculate birth of the Lord. But we see that uh, it says, and he sent uh, by God to a city in Galilee. And again, we saw that it was going to be uh, in uh, Zebulun and Naphtali. That, that was the region up around northern Israel where the Lord was going to roam. But, uh, and we see in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, that... Uh, that uh, he shall be called and says, the Bible says it was, he shall be called a Nazarene. That's one of those complicated verses because we don't, have a, we don't have a verse in the Old Testament that says those exact words. The, but the word Naz, Nazareth is the word stem. And as you look at the, and we have studied and we're looking in the book of Isaiah, stem is the word Nestor, Netzer, sorry. And um, that is the term in which we get the, the word Nazareth, the stem. He was a stem. What, what is it meaning? Of course, he was going to come from Naphtali, the, the regions up north, and he was going to roam around those areas. Uh, but uh, what, what was the stem? What was the branch of Jesse? And again, we see in, back in the book of uh, Isaiah, that word stem is the idea that, uh, that he's an offshoot. And of course, Nazareth was not Jerusalem. Nazareth wasn't even Bethlehem. And of course, the Lord was going to be born in Bethlehem. And so this was, and of course, we know back in um, Matthew, it tells us the reason that uh, Matthew wrote that, let's say that he should be called a Nazarene because the Lord went down to Egypt and then he came back and didn't settle in Jerusalem, but he went on up to Nazareth outside of Herod's control and that's where he was raised and became a man. And this was be an offshoot. This would be a, this was not this was not where Jesse was born. This was where David was born. This is an offshoot. So again, this is where we get the idea that or to get the uh, Matthew's idea that uh, that he would be called a Nazarene, like if uh, Ammonite is or is a, a child of Ammon. Well, this. Uh, if he's a child of the stem, then he would be a Nazarene. So, so this is the idea that, uh, that we're getting. And now you and I don't understand that, but Matthew was writing to Jews and they understood it. They understood exactly those terminologies there. But uh, then again, notice to a virgin. And of course, we've looked at that back in Isaiah chapter seven. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and he shall call his name Emmanuel. And then we see of the house of David. And we can go back to the Davidic covenant where God promised David that it would be from him. And of course, then Isaiah, the, the, the uh, offshoot of Jesse. And of course, the reason he mentioned Je Jesse there is because he was talking about the servant and Jesse was the servant. He wasn't a king, but his son was the, the king. But uh, here we see that Joseph uh, of the house of David. And so here we see the connection between Nazareth and in Bethlehem. And so all this was coming about, but this was taking place way up north, uh, away from uh, what it seemed like the prophecy, where the prophecy was going to be fulfilled. And we see that he came to the, and her virgin's name was Mary. And so and the angel came and said to her, rejoice, be you highly favored. She's the most, she's the most unique woman in all of earth history. She's the mother of the Messiah. And now she's not the mother of God. We'll see that in just a moment. She doesn't proclaim to be the mother of God. The Bible calls her the mother of Jesus, 
our Savior, but not the mother of God. And we'll see that she doesn't have any special heavenly qualities other than the fact that God called her to a very, the most unique opportunity, the most unique position of any woman ever born in history. And so one of the things that we do is, is uh, in, in our churches today, Protestants, whatever you want to call it, Baptists, whatever, is we, we talked about the pendulum that swings back and forth, and it's hard, it's hard to keep it in the middle. But uh, we react a lot of times to things that are wrong. And unfortunately, Mary has been deified in some circles. And so as a result, we don't even mention her much. But this woman was a first-class, high-quality lady. And she is to be remembered as that special woman in his history that brought forth the son. She's right up there with Moses and all the rest. It's interesting how that God included women. It's interesting how they, and we, we like, I'm glad that he included old folks. He included young folks and children in the story and how beautifully it's weaved, woven together in both Matthew and here. God knew that there would be Christmas plays. God knew that people were going to, this, they were going to latch onto this story. And even unsaved people love the story. Children, I listened to a guy this past week. And he said, I got to go see my, uh, I can't go to a ball game. He was a sportscaster. He said, I can't be there because I promised my kids I was going to be. I said, what are your kids? He said, one of my kids is, a, is Joseph and my other kid is a camel. <laughs> so he, he, said, he said, I'm really having trouble with that in my home. You know, one's a camel and one's Joseph. So, but, you know, to, but there again, is it, is it even on air today, people, everybody's familiar with who Joseph is and how the camels, even rightly or wrongly, are identified with the, with the Christmas scene. God knew that. He knew that back before the foundations of the world. And so the great intricate planning. And notice he says, blessed are thou among women. You have a very special place. And he says, and when she saw him, notice now, as she saw his power displayed. And first of all, you're the chosen servant. Out of all the people, and remember, we mentioned earlier, that people were looking forward to the Messiah. And if you had a male child, then there would be a great party. Now, of course, there would be that time of your purification for 30 days before you can, whatever the, the, the Old Testament was. But the idea that, but you would have your friends coming over and bringing gifts, and you would have many uh, uh, baby showers uh, after the birth, not before. For one thing, you know whether it's a boy or a girl. But, you know, they were going to, I mean, this was just when the women would come around. Oh, let me see the little baby. And so the, this, was, this was going to be a great time. And every mother was praying that every time she had a baby, oh, is this going to be the, be the Messiah? And, of course, now we see that she is proclaimed that and the Lord, it wasn't that other women, but notice the angel came and said, you're it. You're the person. He says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have, uh, you have found favor with God. Why did she find favor with God? We're going to see what high qualities this woman had in just a few moments. And we see that he says that uh, you're going to have a miraculous conception. And she says, what's that? I've, I've never, you know, nobody's ever heard of this before. And then again, in the back of my, her mind, she's saying, and nobody's going to believe me. Would you? There again, uh, those who were looking for the Messiah did. But there again, she was accused all of her life. There was always those people that were willing to say, he's the son of a carpenter and uh, a few other things. And so we see that, uh, that this was a tremendous responsibility and yet a glorious opportunity. And notice, he shall be great. His name is going to be called Jesus. Now, the, we've said uh, in the Old Testament, whenever you see the power to name is the power of dominion. And so whenever the Lord named Adam, and then he gave Adam dominion over the garden, and Adam named the animal. And so if you had the power to name, it's interesting in the Old Testament, many of the children were named by the, by the wife. 
And so why she had dominion over the household. And yet, uh, the, her, so there's a lot of things there that, uh, well, I know my kids, I, I had all kinds of good names my wife didn't like. And so uh, she pretty well had the final say, but uh, you know, that's fine. Uh, but, uh, that's, but the power to name is the power to control um, or to power of dominion over them. Um, and uh, that's why some of some of the kids say, "What did or you hear some of these names? What did your mother have against you, or whatever you know?" But uh, there again, the idea that uh, that the Lord named him, she didn't have power over that. Mary, you're going to be all this. You're special, but I name him because I have dominion. I have complete control over this situation. And so he's proclaiming power. And he's going to be the son of the highest. The word highest there is the idea. Uh, the most high. And so, of course, we know God is called uh, the most high. Um, the Lord God will give him uh, the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of David, or house of Jacob. Notice, and there shall be no end. Well, now, where did we see that verse? In Isaiah chapter 9. In his kingdom, there shall be no end. Unto us a son is born. Unto us a child is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and it goes on down. And then of his kingdom, there will be no end. And so we see this, this exact time, this exact planning, the exact um, announcement. And notice in verse 35, he says, And the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. I'm controlling this entire operation, this whole situation. This is something of my doing. It isn't going to be a miracle. It will be a miracle. And so and it's going to be the most, uh, it's going to be the greatest miracle since the crossing of the Red Sea. And of course, it's going to be the greatest miracle until the resurrection. And so we see that he says that the power of the highest shall overshadow you. And, uh, and also, there's another miraculous conception of an older woman that uh, they'd given up on her as having children. And her name is Elizabeth. And by the way, to support you, and I know how, how that, uh, yes, you trust me, but I'm going to reinforce. I'm going to help you. I want you to go down and see her. Folks, God does that with us. God calls us to a holy calling, but he also brings us along to fellowship with one another. And aren't you glad that there are Christians that you know can, will pray with you? Aren't you glad that there are people in this church? I love it when there are people say, you know, there's just something about here where I just feel that the people care. And, and well, don't we all need that? We know that God's called us to a holy living, but it sure is good to have other people that are going through it with us. And so you can imagine now, I imagine the two different women here. One's a young spry girl in her late teens and others up, uh, up probably 40, 50, 60 years old. Probably older than, probably 50 to 70, maybe older. Whatever. It's interesting how that God always does things so unusual that people say only he can do it. How many Jerichos do you see? And we'll talk about Jericho tonight. Only he can do what he did there. How many burning bushes do you have? How many that didn't work consumed? How, who can do that? Only he can do it. And you name all the miracles in the Old Testament. God delights in putting people in positions where they see that only he can do it. And this, we see two miracles here. One's greater than the other, but they are, aren't they both miracles? And so we see that God works in these people and these, and these two ladies. And it's interesting how that the whole uh, idea of the incarnation revolves around two ladies that God has called. And notice in verse 38, and then Mary said, behold, thy men, notice her submission, the maidservant. And this is the exact terminology that we see Hannah uses in her Psalms, or in her song back in, back whenever Samuel was born. And she, you could tell by Mary, Mary has and in this magnificent, which magnificent is a word, my soul does magnify the Lord. The word magnificent comes from that word magnify. It's a Latin term. 
not Greek, but that's it actually was added later on as far as uh, the title of the song. Uh, but we could call it Mary's song. And so we see that uh, uh, that it says uh, that my soul doth magnify the Lord. There are twelve different uh, recitations or, or of uh, allu- allusions or re- uh, recitings of the Old Testament in this song. This woman knew scripture. You say, well, that tells you one thing. That means that uh, uh, ancient women, uh, especially Israeli or Jewish women, they were educated. If they weren't, uh, either that or they listened very good and they were able to quote much scripture. Remember Anna, I almost said Anna, but Anna, she knew scripture quite well. So we see both young and old women during this time, Jews, knew how to read, or at least knew how to, they were educated, let's put it that way. And so, blessed are thou among women. And we see that he says, uh, you know, or let that uh, be according to your word. Notice her submission. And notice now in verse 39, now Mary arose in those days, and she went to the hill country of Judah, and uh, to Zacharias, to the house of Zacharias. Remember, he was a priest. And uh, notice the, how that Mary, again, Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary and the babe leaped in her womb. Now again, a very intricate thing here. And Mary and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now back in Math, or excuse me, in Luke chapter one, verse 15, as the angel was talking to Zacharias, he said that the child would be filled from the, from, with the Holy Ghost, from his mother's womb. And so we see that we have established the fact that children are alive in the, in the womb. But the one question, the medical thing here that uh, Luke leaves us dangling is who was filled first, his mother or the baby? And how much influence does a woman, even in her pregnancy, have over the life of that child within her. We know that, uh, and they've studied, that they find that uh, children start getting their taste for music by the type of music that their mothers listen to. They get a taste for certain foods and certain things by being carried in the womb. You wonder how much, we won't know until we get to heaven, just how much influence that baby's life is influenced before we ever see him with the eye. And so Joseph, the, we have here Luke is very beautifully po- points out that life begins in the womb. And Jesus, if he was six months, notice it was a six month, and now she's about six months along, so the baby had to be an embryo. She stays there three months. And so before she ever started showing at home, God had already influenced, and God was start, God was, was supporting her, and we see reaffirming. And not only it's one thing for you to trust God, it's another thing to see and have people that God is using see that you trust God. It's like uh, the little boy who uh, he had lost his mother, and his father was trying to raise him by himself, and. He was in his own bedroom and it was lightning at night. And uh, the boy runs in and jumps in bed with his dad. And uh, his father said, now, son, uh, don't you think God can protect you? And he said, yes, dad, but I just need somebody with skin on. Sometimes we just need the voice of God with a little bit of skin on it, don't we? Somebody who God uses to speak to us, so that God uses. And boy, I've seen that in my life. Godly men or people that have come along and just reassured me that God was with me. And all of that, this church will be full of people like that. That when you come, we call it affirmation, I guess, but uh, that people affirm you and they encourage you in your faith for the Lord. Many of us, so you're going through some real trials. You're going to a school or you're going to, you're working in a factory or, or you're working in the business world or, or you're at home with a bunch of unsaved relatives and there are doubts and fears and here you are wanting to live for God. And it just is good to have somebody say, you know, 
The Lord's really blessing you, isn't, isn't he? Or sure it's good to see how God's working in your life. I just said encouragement as we encourage one another and so much the more as we see that day approaching. But here the Lord knew exactly what Mary needed and he sends this older lady and she confirms everything that the, the angel has told her and told her father, by the way, Elizabeth, we don't ever see talking to an angel or to the Lord. It's her, father, her husband. And yet we see that she's trusting in the Lord just as much. But here we see that Mary has been talked directly by an angel. And yet God reaffirms it through a spirit-filled woman. Oh, that God can use us. You never know exactly how God is using you when you walk with the Lord. And it might be years later, and, I, and you will have, and I will have. And I praise the Lord. My wife got a letter back just a few months ago. It's a real blessing we just wrote her back. But uh, she just mentioned several things that my wife had taught her. And we, hadn't, we haven't seen that lady at least in 25 years. And yet she still remembers. And she found out where we, where we were. And she just wanted my wife to know what a blessing. But I tell you, folks, that will... You know, and uh, I've done that. I, in fact, I'm so glad back a couple of, a couple of, well, several years ago that I wrote to a man, a, a friend, he was just a couple of years older than me, but he really took me under his wing whenever I gave my life to the Lord. And he put up with me and he, we had a good time together. He became my, one of my best friends. And I just wrote him and I thanked him for being my friend. I'm so glad I did that because he died in COVID, you know? And so you're just so glad that you do that while they're still on earth. And it's good, you never know. And it, it, you know, it just encouraged him so much that, you know, years ago, I mean, I'm talking about when I was 20 and now I'm up in my 50s and I'm writing back to a guy that really had an effect on my life. And I think that some of the best Christmas presents you can do, give, is just let people know that God used them in your life. But God knew exactly what he was doing here with Elizabeth and with Mary. And so we see that Mary um, now, and she's noticed this song. Uh, we don't know whether she composed it here or if Luke got it. From, we don't know exactly how Luke got it, but of course we know it's inspired. And not the, the psalm is just filled full of Old Testament verses. And again, we say it modeled after a uh, um, Hannah's prayer. But first of all, in this, we see that um, it's saturated with scripture. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. And so as she, and we see that this is the terms that are used in Isaiah many times, the magnification of the Lord. And, but, uh, but also notice she is, she worships a, a savior. She acknowledges God as her savior. Folks, sinners don't need a savior. Do they? He saves us from our sin. If I haven't sinned, that I don't need. So that pretty well takes care of the whole idea of the immaculate conception, which is the idea that Mary was perfect. And then she had a perfect child and she was a perpetual virgin for the rest. And now she's in heaven and you can pray to her. Notice she never that she acknowledged God as her savior. And so she is not the mother of God. She's the mother of our savior in the fact that God used her as a vessel, much like he uses us, not in the same, of course, in the same way. There's only one Mary. But we see that um, as, like I tried to give you an exact uh, uh, definition of, um, of Immaculate Conception, which is it holds that from the moment of conception, Mary was kept from all taint of sin. In other words, she was perfect. God said, poof, you're perfect. And she was never sinful again. And so you, we could pray to her and all that. Folks, Mary does not want to be prayed to. There's only one person. Notice how that she points. Yeah, there are people are gonna call me blessed, yes. And that's what we need to do. We want to lift Mary up. But uh, Mary prayed pray to her Savior, like you and I. And by the way, in Mark chapter 
uh, 6, verse 3, you go back and see, you'll see that Jesus had four brothers and then some sisters. It doesn't name the sisters, but uh, we see that he had four brothers. So you can go back and look at that yourself. So she was not the perpetual virgin. virgin. A little bit of scripture messes up a whole lot of bad theology, doesn't it, or bad practice. But see, this is the reason we believe the Bible and not, uh, we don't go into dogma and make something that the Bible doesn't say. That's the reason we don't worship angels. We don't pray to them. We don't pray to Mary. There's one man given among men whereby men must be saved. And who's that? The Lord Jesus. My soul doth magnify. That's the word where we get the word magnificat, the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And so as she submits herself to him, she worshiped him. She trusts in his promises. Notice she says, he has regarded the lowly state of his main, main, uh, maidservant. And this is terminology is just permeated from Hannah's psalm. You can compare these and they're so, they're just so, so obvious that uh, she, she had memorized, like so many Jewish girls would memorize Hannah's song. She was one of the heroes of girls. He said, for behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Notice she doesn't say all generations are going to look down on me as, you know, that lady that uh, had a child out of wedlock. Now, remember, we got to remember that uh, uh, marriage with Mary was different than marriage today. What I mean by that is the contract was signed sometimes years in advance. And we see in the, some of the parables of the Lord, the bridegroom, behold, the bridegroom cometh and the parades that would go through as the bridegroom would go to meet the wife. And that would be the consummation. But it wasn't here comes the bride, it was here comes the groom. <laughs> it's back, and so we've turned it around today. But the idea was that uh, now I am ready. I've, uh, the, the obligations that I have made, I've got, I'm ready to receive her. I have my house. I, I'm going to be able to support her, all this. Now I'm ready to consume, uh, consummate the wedding or the marriage. And so the wedding feast was the bride going to get his wife. And so uh, here we see that, uh, that Mary was a spouse, but she wasn't married. And so this is why we get, by, we get the idea of uh, she was a spouse, but Joseph could have put her away because she broke contract, if she broke contract. But the Lord went and said, no, Joseph. Remember the Lord? Isn't it interesting? The Lord took care of Joseph. He took care of Mary. He took care of Elizabeth. He let people know around what was going on, just the right people. And so we see that um, it says in, uh, in verse 49, we see that mighty things you're going to do through me. She's not afraid. She's, she's saying, Lord, you're going to do this. And it's going to be as your result of your holy name. Lord, you have chosen me to exalt your name. Notice how she is praising God. And the fear is gone. And she's trusting God. Totally for what's going to go on. And we see his mercy is going to, for all generations. But notice in verse, um, <clears throat> in verse 51, he talks about, she talks about the strong arm. And as we go through the book of Isaiah, you'll see that term used over and over again. The strong arm of the Lord. Is the arm shortened that he cannot save? And he'll use that power of the arm and of the hand and he spreads the earth out with his finger i mean the heavens out with his fingers i mean the power and majesty of god and so she uses this biblical terminology so much but the strength of his strong arm um and that um and he and notice also what he does he scatters the proud the lord resists the proud he marshals the, the, his forces against the proud and uh, the proud and the imagination of their hearts. It's interesting uh, what we see today, the proud, how confused they are. They're, are they happy? No, the more that, uh, you think some of those university press professors that uh, we've seen are anti-God and even anti-Israel today, you think they're happy? Look at their homes. Look at some of the things that are going on. I, I listen, and I kind of watch people. And 
watch some of the politicians, watch some of the celebrities. And if you dig into their background, you'll see that they've got all kinds of problems. And how sad it is uh, that, the, that, yes, they've got the power, they got the celebrity, they got the riches. But uh, notice he says, he goes on, he says, he fills the hungry with good things in verse 4, 53, but he sends the rich away empty. And so, yes, they've got all the riches in the world. And I've known men. And what couple did come to my mind just when I said that? That they have everything that materially that I would want. And yet they're miserable. Their kids don't love them. They're always fighting battles with their in-laws. One man told me, you know, people are just waiting for me to die to so get their money. You know, get, get my money. I mean, how sad it is that uh, they've built their lives around riches and they're empty. And so what is it? Uh, uh, the, uh, the writer of Proverbs says, better is, a, uh, is uh, wisdom where love is than a stalled ox. That's a big tractor today uh, and bitterness therein. In other words, a man who has the ox, he's, you know, he's a very prosperous farmer. But the man who has little but has love in his family, what a difference. And so we see that uh, the rich, he sends away empty. And so she's just going through these things and she's remembering who the Lord is. And then she remembers God's mercy, God's mercy extended. And she looks back and she sees, you extended your mercy to Israel. The very reason we're here today is because of your mercy. And folks, the only reason that Israel is here today is because of God's mercy and his loyal love. Now, do they deserve to be loved by God? No, no more than we do. But God told them that he, was, he had a love for them with an everlasting love. And folks, that's why you want to make sure that you follow what God says. That is, you love, that the, God blesses those who will bless them and he will curse those who curse them. Don't be a cursor of the nation of Israel. I get mad with them. I get mad with some of the politics of some of our Jewish politicians and all that, but I am not one to want to hang them or to persecute them. I want to defeat them at the polls, some of them, Others, I want them to, the others, I, I've heard a couple that are running by, I'm for, for them, but they're just people. But as far as a race of people, folks, they are God's special people. And so we see that he remembers Israel, uh, he, his remembrance of his mercy. He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, after a great study in, in, Genesis, uh, in Romans chapter four, where we see that Paul tells us Abraham was a friend of God, and Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. How are you righteous today? It's because he hath made him to be no sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and as a result of that, God has declared you righteous. Judicially, and he covers your sins. He washes away your sins with his own blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But then we skip the verse. And you'll notice it says back in verse 50. And, and uh, Mary is very conscious of generations. She, was, she knew that uh, Elizabeth was probably old enough to be her grandmother. And she knew, she knew others. Or Joseph might have been old enough to be her father. We don't know. But uh, there again, all through life, folks, he's the same God. The, the God of Abraham is your God today. The God of, uh, of the World War II generation is the God today. The God of the yuppie generation is the God of the Gen Zers. And all men must come to him the same way. He that hath the, uh, hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All one-syllable words that a first grader of any generation could understand. 
Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ or do you not? And Mary, she realizes that she is the one that God has chosen to bring forth this great truth. What a great woman she was. But notice Mary worshiped the same God that you and I worship. And can we say, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Do we rejoice in our salvation today? Do we rejoice in the Lord? Rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. Can we trust the Lord as our Savior, as our God, as our comforter, as a God who will lead us through a doubting world and that will use us for his glory? Oh, do you know him? And if you know him, do we glorify him? Do we magnify him in our hearts? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can call you Father this morning. In this generation, no matter what generation we're in, whether young or old, the gospel's for us all. That every man everywhere should repent and come to know you as their personal Savior, not as a church Savior, not as a national Savior, but Lord, as you dealt personally with Mary and with Elizabeth, with Joseph, with Zacharias, with Simeon, with Anna, Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts as a God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, as you spoke to them, as a God of Mary, and the God of, Mary, of Joseph, the God of the Apostle Paul. Oh, Lord, we realize that you never change and that your mercy is to those who fear you to every generation. Oh, Lord Jesus, may people of this generation come to know you as their personal Savior. And may you extend that mercy to them, that loyal love, that freedom, that peace that passes understanding, that joy of the Holy Spirit that only you can give. Lord, use us. Lord, may others look at us and call us blessed, not because of who we are, but what you did through us in touching their lives. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.